I see that the people are still joining. Um, but we have a we have a busy schedule today. So so in the interest of time, I think I'll slowly get us started. Good evening, good afternoon, good good morning, everybody. Um, on behalf of the United Nations Development Program, or UNDP in short, and our partner, the ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights, or APHR, thank you for joining us for this conversation about parliamentarians building peace. My name is Agata Valchak, and I manage UNDP's project on the parliamentary dimension of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. I would, I would like to acknowledge my co-moderator for this session, my colleague, Charles Chubel, who will introduce our speakers in a few moments. Um, let me start by noting uh, that, especially now that politics in so many contexts is infiltrated or even dominated by violent narratives, it has sadly become unusual for us to speak about parliamentarians as peace builders. Uh, but the international community has long recognized a relationship between the conditions required to build and sustain peace and the existence of strong representative institutions. In recognition of this link, UNDP works in partnership with almost one in every three parliaments globally to support them to function more inclusively, accountably, and effectively. An essential part of this work is about empowering the participation and representation of women and girls. Thanks to support from the government of Norway, we've been working to innovate and integrate this work more fully within our broader mandate to promote sustainable human development and peace. And this is how our support to women parliamentarians as peace builders has come about. Violence and hate speech against, against women in, in politics is not a new problem that they've had to face. But with public uh, debate moving increasingly online, it's become much less about dealing with sexist or hateful statements with a name and a face to them, and more about a deluge of online hate and abuse from an army of, of anonymous users, paid trolls, and artificial personas. COVID has compounded the problem. Uh, the MPs we've been working with have made it very clear to us that we must, as a matter of, of absolute priority, work with them to find new and practical ways to, to navigate digital space. Because unless we all work to overcome and reverse this deluge of online violence, many women will, will simply turn away from participating in public life and let alone working as peace builders. Uh, this is the reason why we and our partners at APHR are doing this work and why we're hosting this discussion today. We are humbled to hear from a panel of impressive women champions of peace who have been developing their own rules of engagement online, who have been using their platforms to promote a different quality of discourse, and who have been using their mandates to establish legal and moral accountability in the digital space. Uh, but before I hand over to our speakers, uh, a few brief housekeeping announcements. Uh, first, the webinar is being recorded and will be made available on APHR's Facebook later on. And I also invite you all to participate actively in the discussion by posting your comments and your questions through the Q&A feature at any point during the session. Uh, before our three panelists share their thoughts, um, we'll hear from Helen Clark, who, as many of you know, is the former prime minister of New Zealand, a former UNDP administrator, and who currently serves as patron of the Helen Clark Foundation. It's almost 3 a.m. In, in New Zealand right now. So Helen asked us yesterday to have her remarks pre-recorded and played to us now. And we are delighted that we can open our session today with, with her keynote despite the time zone challenges. So if I can ask my colleagues to start the video for us.
Lauren, we can't hear the video. So if you can please unmute and play the, Hi there. Play the video, the video from the top with, with sound. Checking out. Can you hear now? Feeling yes. with violence hate speech in the district. Back to the beginning. Two years ago, recording keynote address. Let me begin by thanking the co-organizers of this event, UNDP and ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights. We're meeting virtually in the context of the annual meeting of the UN Commission on the Status of Women. It's both an important and a timely opportunity to be discussing the disturbing and the exponential increase in gendered online violence and what could be done to turn the situation around. So, first, some comments about the challenges of dealing with violence and hate speech in the digital space. Two years ago this month, in Christchurch, New Zealand, an extremist murdered 51 people and injured a further 40 in two mosques. The perpetrator was able to live stream his atrocities. His horrifying video was viewed over 4,000 times and it was widely shared across social media platforms before Facebook's algorithmic monitoring mechanisms picked it up and removed it. Quite apart from the inherently devastating nature of the tragedy, the massacre also focused global attention on the way in which the online environment enables and actually amplifies the voices of extremists and perpetrators of violence in general. In response, what is known as the Christchurch Call to Action was initiated by New Zealand's Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern. The summit on the Christchurch Call was co-hosted by her and President Macron of France in May 2019 in Paris. Many countries, organizations and online providers signed the Christchurch Call. It contains collective and individual commitments from each sector to actions which would make the digital space safer. After the finalization of the call to action, my foundation, the Helen Clark Foundation, proposed the Christchurch principles, which are intended to complement, to flesh out, and to help guide the implementation of the call to action. The principles we drew up relate to the spectrum of harmful online content. And they look at ways that inclusive governance could be strengthened in the face of these online challenges. They also encourage engagement in the way that government, civil society and businesses exercise their responsibilities in the digital era. So what has happened to the call to action and where could we go from here? Well, despite the grand partnership envisaged by the Christchurch call, follow-up has been rather limited. And there could be a range of reasons for that. Firstly, no doubt, the global pandemic and the sense of ongoing crisis that's come from that have played a part. But there's some irony that given so much debate and discourse during the pandemic has moved from the in-person to the digital sphere, that perhaps the Christchurch call hasn't had more traction. We've seen a surge in online violence over the last year, encompassing fake news, disinformation, hate speech, threats, often targeting women and people with particular vulnerabilities. Then, while the Christchurch call was praised and adopted by heads of state and government around the world, the United States, under its previous presidential administration, did stand back arguing that its constitutional arrangements, especially the First Amendment right to freedom of expression, prevented it participating. That the host country for most of the major online platforms declined to sign up was obviously a setback. Moreover, the definition of government in the Christchurch call is very executive branch focused, and that ignores the roles which other branches, including the world's parliaments can play. This, of course, is not unusual in the multilateral discourse. We tend to overlook 
our parliament, despite their being so important. Then the big tech platforms have not been universal subscribers to the Christchurch call. And those which have endorsed it have applied the safeguards which is envisaged a bit unevenly. So taken all together, the factors I've just described have limited the creation of a better enabling environment in which civil society could realistically take effective action in support of the Christchurch call. So what could we do now? Especially in light of the rise of online abuse and its dangerous potential to discourage women from public and political activism, it's time now to recommit to the principles underpinning the Christchurch call. We can't allow threats to representative democracy to go unchallenged. Moreover, unless we encourage the broadest and the most inclusive participation in public life, we don't have much chance of achieving sustainable human development. At this time, when progress towards the 2030 agenda has been reversed by the pandemic, it's not acceptable. In recommitting to the Christchurch call, in the context of a renewed commitment also to the Sustainable Development Goals and to reinvigorating inclusive and representative governance, it's important to look at what is working in practice. Therefore, the perspectives of the three women MPs and the civil society leader who are about to share their experiences in this event are very valuable, as is the discussion which will follow. In light of the situation I've been describing, their work in practical peace building, including on how to displace online violence and insist on more respectful forms of dialogue and discourse is of great importance and we must heed their words. I was proud to be UNDP administrator for eight years, and I know that it continues to be the world's biggest provider of parliamentary development programming, and that all such programming includes a strong gender component. So I was very pleased to hear that a UNDP global project funded by the government of Norway to support women parliamentary peace builders has helped bring today's discussion together. And I truly wish the project and the women parliamentary peace builders everywhere, every success in their important work. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren, and, and a big thank you to Helen for setting the scene for, for our discussion by reminding us about the Christchurch call and the foundation's principles and, and, and through the on-point diagnosis where we are two years later. So uh, with this, I'm handing over to Charles to, to introduce our panel. Thank you very much, Agatha. Uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I can see from the participants list that we have a wealth of knowledge uh, and capacity on the issues of governance, uh, women's participation, uh, and the need to uh, build and sustain peace uh, in this forum today. So I do very much look forward to, uh, with Agatha, moderating the discussion uh, in the Q&A as we go forward. But without um, any further delay, because we uh, we have such uh, a rich resource in our panelists and our discussant. I'd like to begin uh, the, uh, uh, the panel presentations now. And to that end, I want to introduce the uh, first speaker, the Honourable Aida Kasimadeva. Aida Kasimadeva has been a member of the uh, Parliament of Kyrgyzstan and its vice speaker since 2017, where she's focused on women's rights and the empowerment of vulnerable groups, including by championing various efforts of members of parliament, civil society and others. Prior to her parliamentary career, she was a journalist and a producer in both Kyrgyz and international media, where she focused on women's rights and social issues. Uh, Vice Speaker, uh, it's a, a particular personal honour uh, for me to welcome you again. Two years ago, as I said, we hosted your 
off, so I want it back in especially in light of what we're doing in the current political climate. Uh, we would be very much look forward to hearing from you. Hello to everybody, dear panelists, dear guests, dear hosts. Uh, it's very nice uh, to be here. It's very interesting and uh, difficult uh, an actual topic uh, for all uh, women, women of the region. Let me describe the situation in Kyrgyz Republic. Kyrgyz Republic is in Central Asia and um, and the hate speech against uh, women politics is uh, uh, not, not a new problem uh, for uh, politicians, for women politicians, but uh, as uh, uh, you mentioned before, uh, it's uh, quite uh, changed uh, rapidly uh, because of the digital space and because of the social media. It's uh, paid trolls and uh, anonymous uh, users. And uh, uh, in our late, uh, latest research in Kyrgyzstan about the stereotype, gender stereotypes, uh, our peak and the, uh, the highest uh, uh, rate of the hate speech uh, was uh, in 2020 during the parliamentarian elections. And um, as you know, in Central Asia, most of the society uh, still uh, the structure of society is uh, patriarchal and uh, in rural places, uh, most, uh, most in rural places, it's uh, uh, for women, it's very difficult. It's bullying and uh, hate speech and uh, it's uh, mentioning family status and the status of the woman. I think that uh, every Participation, uh, partic participant in this uh, panel uh, is uh, know, know uh, very well the situation. And, but uh, today uh, it's very important to be here because uh, uh, for me, it's uh, um, uh, for all of us, for Kyrgyz women, it's uh, uh, really uh, we need to uh, to know and uh, to discuss uh, the new ways how to uh, build new models, uh, new recommendations, maybe laws, because um, yes, we say that uh, social media is uh, very active and the hate speech against the politician women is very active, but uh, before this um, year, and uh, especially during a pandemia, um, we just start to discuss it. And uh, I think that uh, after, uh, uh, after this discussion, after uh, all researches, we can come to very um, uh, important uh, decisions. And uh, as a, a parliamentarian of Kyrgyz uh, Republic, uh, I think that uh, we have a very, very strong uh, parliament and uh, uh, in Parliament, uh, um, the uh, experience of the uh, gender council, we have a gender council and uh, it's very inclusive. And also we have a very vibrant uh, civil society, a very active uh, civil society, very active media, and the democracy process in Kyrgyzstan uh, also is very active, it's very strong. and. Uh, uh, this gender council and uh, uh, caucus of the uh, women parliamentarians are working together with the leaders uh, in rural places, with uh, NGO, with uh, civil society, with government, and uh, we always meet with women uh, during the pandemic uh, online, before very active in rural places, and we are organizing uh, spaces uh, in uh, uh, regional spaces, world spaces, and also rural places. I, and uh, also uh, dis uh, discuss with the women, meet with women, motivate them, and uh, also hear their suggestions. And uh, I think it's uh, quite um, effective. And uh, the, we can say that Kyrgyz parliament this, uh, and women in parliament uh, made a huge work uh, about it, and uh, but the uh, about the hate speech. 
uh, I can say by myself and uh, also by my colleagues, um, it's a main risk and um, the bad, uh, very bad thing, uh, bad impact of hate speech is, uh, but every woman is uh, um, uh, afraid and uh, not um, uh, saying her, uh, her op opinion and uh, she is very censored and, uh, and she say only very um, not sharp things. Uh, we shouldn't. Uh, uh, we shouldn't do this. And uh, also, the main problem is. Uh, um, uh, I don't know how in other society, but uh, if you are active woman, if you are leader, if you are uh, in parliament, other women uh, they don't support you, usually, and. Uh, uh, support the parliamentarian and uh, women parliamentarian and also support politics women in politics uh, it's also a very important topic it's new topic and psychological support and trainings and uh, uh, to give some tools it's uh, quite a new uh, sphere and very um, big job to do so uh, but with our gender council in parliament, with the women caucus, I think that we can manage it, manage it and uh, to navigate. Uh, the main thing is, uh, the main tool is to react. If you see uh, during elections, uh, during crisis, that's uh, against, against one woman in politics, uh, it's a hate speech and bullying. Uh, organizations and the, and the gender council and NGOs, they should react. They should discuss it uh, openly. They should say uh, juridically, they, uh, they should um, do it uh, on the agenda. And uh, uh, I see that uh, it helps because when, uh, when people see their reaction and they, uh, the, uh, the attempt to stop it, and uh, explanation is it's very important and also um, um, i'm sorry sorry madam uh, vice mm -hmm. speaker we we need to ask you to uh, now summarize and, and wrap up please because we we have such limited time thank you mm -hmm. uh, my suggestions is uh, uh, we uh, should involve uh, every actor its government its politicians its parliament of course, it's an NGO, of course, it's donors, and together, together discuss and together react and together make research and uh, uh, suggest new tools as a law, as a, um, new rules uh, or research. And uh, uh, thank you very much. I will, uh, um, uh, I will ask your questions and uh, don't be shy to ask questions. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Madam Vice Speaker. And uh, just a reminder uh, that uh, please do uh, put your questions to the panelists in the uh, Q&A uh, space so that we can make sure that we uh, get as many of them addressed during the course of the discussion as possible. Also, apologies for the initial problems with sound, uh, both with uh, Ms. Clark's pre-record and then with my introduction. I hope we've resolved those now. I'm, I'm now delighted to turn to our second panelist, uh, Kasturi Rani Pato, whom I had the pleasure to uh, first meet uh, two years ago at the uh, annual meeting of Parliamentarians for Global Action in Cabo Verde where we had uh, extremely uh, useful and interesting interchanges on, on a range of issues. Uh, Kasturi has been a member of the Parliament of Malaysia since 2013. She's an active member of our co-host, uh, ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights, and currently serves on the steering group of the International Panel of Parliamentarians for Freedom of Religion or Belief. She's been actively leveraging her social media platform to amplify the voices of women and other groups in, in the face of uh, all the negative amplification uh, that we see those platforms used for. Uh, and she's been ensuring that migrant worker and refugee populations in particular uh, are uh, not stigmatized and, and marginalized in these, in these fora. So without further ado, uh, the Honorable 
Kastirani. Pato, the floor is yours. Thank you again for your participation. Hi, Charles. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, Honourable Miss Helen Clark, Honourable Vice Speaker Ida Kasimaliba, uh, Honourable Miss uh, Umzile Van Dam, representatives from United Nations Development Programs and ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights, ladies and gentlemen and friends. First and foremost, I would like to extend my profound gratitude to the esteemed co-organizers, especially the courageous Desi Hanara for giving me this opportunity and for inviting me to speak at this timely, salient and important event. Why? Because there is no best time than now to not just continue, but to promote, increase and advance the conversation on how to generate women parliamentarian champions and amplify their roles for peace building. While the shift to the digital environment has helped advocacy work to continue amidst the face-to-face -face restrictions during the pandemic, the challenges presented have also been serious. We have increasingly seen a wave of misinformation, disinformation, hate speech and discrimination, fake news, sexism, racism, religious bigotry, xenophobia, homophobia, as the world grapples with COVID-19 pandemic. As parliamentarians, we are well placed to overcome these challenges through our roles as legislators, political party representatives and elected officials. But that also does not discount the fact that we are also easy targets by hate mongers. The fourth estate for democracy is power to the press and news media and be protected at all costs. The further narrowing for media space on freedom of expression and speech is indicative of governments that are still trapped in the government's knows best fashion, which is a recipe for disaster in this time and age of the Industrial Revolution 4.0. When it comes to issues related to online and offline hate speech, including cyberbullying, we have observed how hate speech has posed a dangerous threat to democratic values and vulnerable minorities, including women. It dismantles open discourse, diminishes healthy political debate, affects electoral democracy, results in non-civilized socio-political discourses, exacerbates societal and racial tensions, and incites discrimination, violence, and hostility. Hate speech has widely pro pro proliferated in Southeast Asia, some of which has transpired into hate crimes and physical violence. Fear has been generated among communities, and the incitement of hate has spurred atrocities, for example, against the Rohingya community, and more recently on the coup d'etat in Myanmar by the junta military. As the world battles COVID-19, and the public sphere is increasingly digitized. Hate speech has exacerbated xenophobia, hate and exclusion. Governments, politicians and some irresponsible human rights groups reportedly exploited COVID-19 related fears to scapegoat minorities around the world, including in Southeast Asia. Such acts have led to a concerning rise in verbal and physical abuses and discrimination against vulnerable groups including religious minorities, migrants and refugees in many parts of the region. And central to those abuses are harmful gender narratives. Excellencies, honorable MPs, ladies and gentlemen and friends. To address these challenges, I've undertaken initiatives in my various capacities. At the international and regional levels, I'm a member of the steering group of the IPP4, which is the International Panel of Parliamentarians for the Freedom of Religion and Belief. And I'm also an active member of the ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights. Additionally, I'm also in the Executive Council for the Parliamentarians for Global Action. I'm pleased to share with members of Parliament here and to those listening that, that I'm also a member in the Parliamentarian Parliamentary Rapid Response Team, short formed as PART, P-A-R-R-T, which was launched last year under the Parliamentarians for Global Action in May 2020. It was set up under the Campaign for Democratic Renewal and Human Rights and serves to respond nimbly, intervening when parliamentarians and human rights defenders and now journalists who are at risk. Most recently, we launched a global parliamentary code of conduct, which we hope would be adapted by members of parliament to use as a term of reference. Under the framework of the joint project of APHR and IPP4, we have established South Asia Parliamentarians for Freedom of Religion or Belief, SEPFOB, 
which has undertaken a number of initiatives to tackle hate speech and safeguard fundamental freedoms, including the right to freedom of religion or belief and freedom of expression. To prevent the spread of online religious hate during political campaigns and elections in Indonesia, we have set up a task force to tackle online religious hate, hate speech consisting of representatives from parliamentarians, social media companies, relevant line agencies, faith leaders and CSOs. Likewise, ahead of Myanmar's 2020 general elections, we organized a training workshop for parliamentarians, electoral candidates and political parties representatives to prevent them from deploying, deploying hateful narratives online and offline during the campaigns and elections. Similar training workshops have also been conducted in Thailand and Malaysia. In our advocacy, legal and policy reforms have become a mainstay of our recommendations. At present, we are opposing draft laws that resort to criminal sanctions for hate speech and blasphemy in some countries in the region, while at the same time seeking to prioritize a number of other positive measures, such as capacity building, interfaith dialogue, policy dialogue, po po positive narratives changes campaign, and the better integration of four principles into laws. In Malaysia, it was alarming to see the surge in online hate speech against refugees and migrants. Last year, after my government pushed back boats of Rohingya refugees and cracked down on undocumented migrants in mass raids. Just last month, I joined other MPs condemning the Malaysian government's deportation of more than 1,000 Myanmar detainees back to certainty. To me, on a personal level, looking at the brutality, savagery and violence by the junta military, it felt like the Malaysian government was doing an Auschwitz all over again. Men, women and children were on three boats sent back to Myanmar. It was exactly a month ago today, 23rd of February, and we have no news about them. Despite the dangerous rhetoric against migrants online, it was encouraging to see that many Malaysians also united to stand in solidarity with the migrant communities by raising awareness using the hashtag Migrant Jugger Manusia. I firmly believe that we can use such positive and inclusive narratives to combat hate speech and challenge negative attitudes, to counter the xenophobic rhetoric against migrants and refugees. APHR is working on a narrative change campaign and toolkit for Parliament Asia to promote positive narratives in, on migration. Initiatives like can help to shift harmful narratives to ones that are based on human rights. Particularly as women, it is important that our voices are represented and that we speak up for our rights and those of minorities. This is not always easy because we are often the targets of online attacks as well, which I'm sure that many of my fe female colleagues can attest to. I myself have been, have been called racial slurs in parliament and a deviant for speaking out in defense of religious mi minorities while racist, sexist, and other hateful comments are commonly spread on social media. We must stand beside those on the receiving end and make it clear that such rhetoric is never acceptable. I look forward to collaborating with like-minded individuals and organizations to strengthen peace building, tackling hate, and promoting discourses of respect nationally, regionally, and globally. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to the honourable member for those uh, very thought provoking comments. Um, I'm delighted now to move to our final uh, MP speaker, as they say last but not least, mm -hmm. uh, Pumzele Van Dam has been a member of the Parliament of South Africa from the Democratic Alliance since 2014. She is currently a member of the Communications and Digital Technologies Committee and a former shadow minister of communications and the former spokesperson in this area for the, the Democratic Alliance, as well as a whip for the party now, as, as I understand. Uh, Ms. Van Dam, it's, it's, it's a delight to have you participating. I'm gonna call on you now directly to, um, to make your remarks. You have the floor, thank you. Thank you so much for, for having him, for, for having me, uh, all protocol observed. I think um, to echo the sentiments of the previous speakers, um, women politicians are subject to far greater abuse on the online space, um, not just from uh, you know hate speech or cyber from hate speech to cyberbullying to misinformation to derogatory images posted of us online, um, and on a practical level, 
um, from myself as a female politician. I have simply viewed it as I will not be silenced in the online space. I will say what I have to say and uh, tackling those instances where I think there is hate speech or misinformation and using the platform that the tools available on the specific platforms to report such instances. And for younger MPs uh, who might find difficulty in dealing with that, um, I make sure that I prevent, uh, provide them with mentorship, make sure that they have the tools so that they can communicate their views, um, not only just in parliament, but specifically online as that's the topic we're speaking to today and just encouraging them to just keep going. Um, I was in a UNCSW panel last week where there was a, a lady who wanted to be a mayoral candidate in her hometown in Colombia. And she was saying how afraid she was of uh, joining Twitter because she felt she'd be under severe attack. And all I said to her was like, there's no, not a single space that us as women cannot enter and have an equal say at the table. Now, just on a practical level, what steps we're taking in South Africa, particularly I'm taking as the representative for my party dealing with the with social media and in the online space. So we've taken very really practical um, steps. And as a first one, we have asked Facebook to appear before our parliament, which they are doing in May. And we want to ask them very direct questions about what steps they're going to be taking to deal with disinformation in general. Because um, the culture that exists um, of hate speech against women, of misinformation, of cyberbullying, is one that needs to be tackled by the platforms themselves. Um, I mean, we can go in and create the kind of messaging, but ultimately it's the platforms that need to use their specific, their own rules in order to moderate content, in order to make sure that they do not um, allow for the destruction of liberal democracy, as we've seen, um, misinformation is the number one global threat to democracy. So those are the very practical steps we're taking by going directly to the platforms themselves. Um, and I think it's also very important just for each country to have their own public education campaigns about how they relate to women and, and, and leadership roles, because we can do all that work that we do um, on, the, on the online space that we do in our various parliaments. But if the misogynistic patriarchal beliefs continue to exist in the countries that we work in, um, there's, you know, you are, to use a, a, a term, because um, I can't think of the correct one now, pissing in the wind. Um, so it's really about educating the populace to say, you know, there's gender equality, the voices of women count just as much. But also, I think it's our work as female politicians now to make it easier for those that come behind us. Um, we are the ones at the front lines that deal with the being attacked and we have to stand strong, we need to stand firm and we need to be an example to young women in our country to show them that um, as women will not be silenced, we will continue to speak out and we will stand up to bullies, we'll stand up to cyber bullies, we are there to change the patriarchal, the mis misogynistic beliefs that exist in our various countries that allow for this kind of hate speech to, to triumph. Um, so I don't know if I spoke within my time, um, but yeah, I mean, to summarize, my belief is it is up to us as women to be at the front line, to take some of those attacks, to make it easier for the ones that will come behind us. Um, like the women who came before us made it easier for us to be parliamentarians. Um, I think on social media, we need to take the struggle head on, go to the platforms themselves. I'm also part of the Grand Committee on uh, Fake News, which is a 
group of, of uh, legislators from around the world that deal with digital privacy, that deal with um, hate speech, with, with fake news. So that's also just a really useful network to be part of um, for information sharing, to hear what different legislators are doing in their different um, countries um, to deal with the proliferation of, um, I don't like the term fake news, of misinformation, of hate speech, and how, what steps can be taken to protect um, digital privacy. Thank you so much for those observations, Ponzile. Very powerful, uh, as, uh, as were your predecessors. Uh, and I think we can see from the chat box, the Q&A, that we're going to have a very interesting uh, few moments uh, following as we conclude the, the, the webinar. Before I call on our first discussant, uh, I'd just like to hand back briefly to Agatha because she, uh, we, we, we've been thinking about ways to try to make the discussion as interactive as possible and, uh, and she's going to present one of those ideas. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. Um, we now heard from our speakers and we would like to hear from you. Uh, you will see that we've just launched a Zoom poll to learn from you what you think should be the initial priority of elected representatives when they take on the, the, the challenge of addressing violence in the digi digital space. Uh, the poll is anonymous and you can access it by clicking on the poll function in the Zoom taskbar at the bottom. So please fill it out at any point before the end of the session so that we can come back to it um, as we wrap up later on. Uh, thank, thank you and, and back to you, Charles. Thank you very much, Agatha. And as both Agatha and Helen Clark indicated in the introductory remarks to this webinar, uh, the value of your comments, uh, filling in the poll, responding and, and sparking off what we, we've heard from the panelists is very plain to us. We have a program, we've been told very clearly, uh, if you want women peace builders in parliament, you have to uh, help us to deal with creating an enabling environment. And at the moment, thanks to this online uh, deluge of abuse and violence, uh, there's this huge uh, turning away of, of good women from public life and participation. So the importance of this discussion is to help us, uh, along with a whole lot of other interventions, find programmatic tools and design them and then help implement them so that we can uh, empower the women that you're hearing from today further, not that they <laughs> themselves probably need a whole, whole lot more empowerment, but the whole uh, you know, collective body of, of, of well-intentioned women parliamentary peace builders and their male allies and in, in parliament, civil society and elsewhere uh, to deal with and, and turn around this deluge of hate. So I want to now uh, call on our first discussant before we open the Q&A generally. Uh, Maria Blagovic, uh, welcome. Uh, a political and civil activist for almost a decade dealing with human rights and gender equality. She's a member of the Women's Political Network of Montenegro, a civil society organization, and a former advisor to the president of the parliament uh, of that country. She's currently a trainer for gender equality in political parties and gender mainstreaming in public administration. And she'll offer some comments uh, on, on what we've just heard before we open the, the floor generally. Uh, thank you, Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Agatha. Thank you all for having me here. Uh, it is really a pleasure to see some familiar faces. We have had the opportunity a couple of months ago to discuss uh, similar topics. And uh, today I am very inspired by uh, all the panelists uh, uh, from before. It is very uh, kind of difficult to wrap up, to, to, to touch upon uh, everything that they have said, but uh, I will just try to um, make a couple of points and maybe to put it in the perspective of uh, the similar things that uh, Women's Political Network of Montenegro has been working recently regarding uh, violence against women in politics, uh, which can be transferred in a way in 
violence against women in public sphere as well, because the, the principle is the same and the, the tools are the same and uh, the um, ways that uh, it is displayed are the same. So um, I, I'm very pleased that uh, Ms. Clark at the beginning said that uh, collective and uh, individual commitments uh, from uh, actors in all spheres are very important. Uh, and that's what we have been trying to do as well. Um, and uh, Aida also said that um, uh, hate speech uh, uh, escalated quickly because of the spread of the social media, but also because of the pandemic. And I would agree. I would say that uh, it's a common uh, common issue uh, in all our countries, and it has been escalating. I mean, it has been present before, but uh, maybe it is more visible now, and uh, it is uh, more difficult to contain it uh, because uh, we are trying to tackle the new issue with uh, with old means, which is kind of impossible, and that's something that. Uh, um, um, a colleague from South Africa said uh, brilliantly that uh, the problem needs to be tackled uh, also but, uh, by platforms, not only by those who are using it. So uh, in Montenegro, uh, Women's Political Network, which is a network of uh, women from 18 political parties, uh, from opposition and government as well, um, uh, we are trying to uh, tackle the issues that we all agree on. We are trying to promote uh, female solidarity. And in our country, we had elections. I think that uh, um, Ms. Pato said that, uh, that uh, elections were, that, 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 that parliamentary code of conduct is something that is very important and Aida was saying about how um, how violence is more visible during elections. We had elections in August as well and it is uh, unbelievable how many uh, disgusting uh, uh, manifestations of hate speech we have had uh, during the campaign, after the campaign, because uh, we now for the first time have like uh, four or five women in, 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 in government, which is a huge number for us. And uh, it is, it is uh, not only uh, uh, trying to diminish women uh, uh, using their family, using their private life, it is also uh, trying to, um, to discourage them for, uh, from um, do, uh, being in politics and public sphere. Uh, so Women's Political Network just launched uh, a research that has been done during last year. And it has shown that nine out of 10 women in, uh, politi in politics in Montenegro have been the victims of, uh, of um, violence, uh, mostly from the colleagues from their parties. And uh, seven out of 10 uh, said that uh, the biggest arena where the violence against women is happening is actually in media. And three out of those seven would say that it's social media. So that's why it is important to know that we have to tackle this issue uh, by cooperating. So parliaments have very important role. Uh, parties itself have very important roles because uh, they have internal rules and those rules reflect uh, uh, on women when they become MPs as well. It is more difficult for them to, 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 to become it and the media as well. Uh, so our set of recommendation, for example, I mean, uh, uh, regarding Montenegro, but it can be uh, actually used, I think, in in uh, a lot of countries in the world because this uh, issue is very similar and we maybe have different backgrounds in a way, but we have uh, same problems. Patriarchy is uh, present everywhere, unfortunately. So um, we, uh, we said that the uh, uh, parliaments, uh, parties and media uh, have to be uh, responsible, have to uh, apply gender perspective in everything they do, they have to be educated. And some of the previous panelists said we are always talking with women. We should be talking with uh, uh, men as well, uh, because uh, uh, they have to be uh, partners, they have to be educated as well, they have to recognize uh, how hate speech looks like. It is very sad when the speaker of the parliament or a member of the parliament uh, who is uh, uh, in charge of the session is not aware what is happening because if he was aware or she was aware, he would stop it immediately and that would be example and example and another example 
and of course laws that are very important. And just for the end, I have to say that uh, my, my previous colleague, previous panelist said something that I think is actually very important and amazing that uh, we have to be strong and that we have to be examples for younger women because uh, if it wasn't uh, for uh, those before us who actually uh, were uh, basically dying uh, in order that we, for us to have uh, right to vote, to educate, to be uh, economically independent, uh, we wouldn't be um, uh, now uh, sitting here and talking about this or having this issue. So I, I just really hope that uh, uh, we would uh, do better and that we would leave um, a heritage for those that come uh, after us and that it will be a better uh, place and an easier place for a woman to be in politics. Thanks. Thank you, Maria. Uh, excellent commentary on, on I think, what we, we, we've heard before. Now, I don't want to um, waste time, so we move first to a question uh, from one of our participants. Uh, I'm wondering if our speakers have any concrete examples or methods, I should probably say further concrete examples, because this question came in relatively early, on how to respond to hate speech. Any examples, especially of successful methods or tools? Any of the panelists is welcome to come in here and uh, present a practical example, please. Well, um, to give a practical example, if I may go first. Um, yes, please, Eli, thank you. Yes, um, I am, you know, South Africa is a country where there is a very fractured history of apartheid where racism um, can be quite prevalent. And um, I think on the social media space, what I do is report. And I think it's a very practical example and um, where there's a very clear example of racism, you report the tweets and uh, at least on, the, on, on, on Twitter, you report the tweets and in most instances, um, those accounts will be suspended or they'll have limits put, ag put against them. Um, so I think that as a practical example is important. But I think that is just a kind of a band-aid over a greater problem. Um, and to kind of reiterate what I've said before, it takes a whole of society approach to deal with the problem. Um, it requires changing the mindsets. It requires how young men are brought up. Um, the current generation of boys are brought up to respect women. Um, I don't know if there's one singular answer to what is a societal problem. Um, it requires a whole a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, where every single role player has something to do, churches, community organizations, and, and individuals. It's up to you as an individual. You see an instance where there's hate speech that you take a stand. So I think it's everyone's responsibility to lend a hand against what is an issue that is pervasive across the globe, where it has its different iterations in, the, in different countries. But I really think there isn't one answer and everyone must play their role. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I wonder if we could then, I don't want to cut anybody off if they want to make an intervention, but we had a related question to Kasturi about the Ready Response Team. So I wonder uh, in particular whether that's something you could just briefly tell us a bit about, whether it's uh, been activated or you've been able to activate it, whether it has led to a concrete diminution in, in online violence. Uh, I think it's something that, that probably uh, participants would like to hear a little more about. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. Um, so the part uh, action uh, um, team under the Parliamentarians for Global Action uh, actually focuses more on uh, any kind or form of threat on parliamentary democracy, particularly on parliamentarians. It is just recently that we have branched that out to a code of conduct, particularly on, on uh, media freedom and how journalists and elected reps, including women parliamentarians, have been targets uh, on social media. 
um, if you are a member of parliament and do not have a setup uh, in your parliament comprising of MPs from both the government, opposition and independence, uh, then I think you should start to form a group and reach out to the parliamentarians for global action and tell them that you have, you would like to be a part uh, of uh, the movement, the part of the campaign uh, with parliamentarians for global action. Um, the first statement that was issued by the part, which is the response team, was on uh, how Malaysia last year uh, did not allow for parliament to convene. Uh, and that, in other words, robbed our right and our voices to speak uh, in parliament for check and balance, for accountability, for integrity, particularly answers regarding how the government was managing uh, the pandemic. Um, so these are, these are, and then uh, there were interventions on what was happening in uh, Ethiopia, what was happening in Zimbabwe, uh, statements that were issued on uh, particular issues of what was happening in individual countries, especially when there was a threat to uh, parliamentary democracy. But I also want to just touch a little bit on the question of how do we deal with um, uh, racist statements that are made on social media. Um, of late, I normally uh, name and shame, and it has worked. So apart from making a report to the uh, um, social media uh, management, whether it's Facebook, mm. or Instagram, or uh, Twitter, um, I also take a screenshot of the kind of conversation and the words that we used. And I, I expose them and I say, this is the kind of language that has been hurled against someone. It doesn't matter if I'm an MP or not, but such language exists in our culture. It exists in the system only because it was never addressed in the first place. Uh, I agree with my colleague from uh, South Africa that it's not about just having laws and it's not about punishing. And that is what most conservative governments do. They just look at, it's a very punitive approach, which is to punish, which to come up with more stringent laws. And then you, it's difficult to draw the line between freedom of speech and expression and what is fake news at the end of the day. Um, so it has to come down to a rehabilitative approach. It's education, it's awareness, it's what we teach our young men and women on what it, what it is, you know, when we speak about gender, when we speak about women empowerment, when we speak about homophobia, when we speak about xenophobia, etc. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's not just up to MPs to be talking about it. It's always a problem for MPs. We're always talking about the issue, but then the general public, you know, it doesn't seem to affect them because it's so normal. It's become so social. It's become so acceptable to be called this, but no, you know, today it is this. Today it is a language that was used this way. Tomorrow it will be uh, turned into an action. Just like how there's no such thing as a rape joke. Today it's a joke. Tomorrow it will be rape, you know. So, yeah. And it was interesting because I just read an article in the BBC about so, my colleague. Sorry, from I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. We have to, we have to, to, to close because uh -huh. we're... We're on, on time. Um, very quickly finish this. <laughs> very, very, very quickly then, please. Okay. Yep. It's, it's about this article I read in BBC about uh, our colleague from South Africa and how she stood up for herself when a racist slur was was uh, uh, made against her. And I think for those who don't know, you should read up that on, on BBC. It was very powerful. And I think it was really good that you, sh you did that because that is a message you're going to be sending to a lot of people out, especially young women who have to deal with this kind of language against them. That's all, Charles. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I want to, um, I'm sorry, Aida and Maria, that we won't have an opportunity to, to come to you further comment, but I really do want to just repeat again how powerful your interventions were, and thank you very much. First, I'm going to share the results of the poll. Uh, you'll see that um, there's a, a good mix of uh, uh, suggestions, partnerships for advocacy, awareness raising, and digital, liter digital literacy uh, comes up strongly, as does regulation, oversight, uh, advocating the use of new technologies, which we've, we've heard about. I also now just want to do a brief sum up, if I may, because I think for us, uh, I'd like you to um, hear what we took uh, as panelists and participants from this and what we're going to, to take away in terms of programmatic uh, design and implementation. First of all, we heard from Helen uh, about the importance of reinvigorating partnership between uh, government, including parliamentarians, civil society, 
and tech companies, but making it meaningful and, and having a proper empowering environment, learning the lessons of COVID and, and going forward. Then Aida stressed the importance of strong linkages between parliamentarians and civil society, systemic partnerships to create spaces uh, and voices for women where they could speak safely and, and, and discuss the issues that matter and then ensure that their representatives took those issues forward. Uh, Kasturi, you, you very powerfully highlighted for us the fact that this, is a, uh, this phenomenon is an awful phenomenon, a disenfranchising phenomenon for women, but it also applies across the board, LGBTI people, religious minority members, immigrants, uh, the most vulnerable in society, their vulnerability is amplified uh, by this uh, behavior and by these platforms. And we have to find and deploy new solutions such as some of the ones you mentioned uh, in response. Pumzela, you, I think uh, you made a number of very powerful um, observations, both in your answer and in your, your intervention. Uh, you know, what I really took uh, was the importance of using the, the, the MP platform, uh, summon the, uh, the, 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 uh, the tech companies, name and shame, as you said, uh, um, both you and, and, and Katsuri, the, the importance of using every aspect of the parliamentary role, uh, representation, oversight, potentially lawmaking. Uh, there was even a, a mention in, in, in the interventions of the importance of codes of conduct. So I think you know, deploying all these, uh, these modalities is important. You also mentioned the importance of education, and of uh, women champions empowering uh, those who, who are yet to come. And I think, you know, particularly in response to one of Aida's observations, it's very important we, we don't neglect the, uh, the vital importance of growing such champions and empowering them uh, to act as, as, as mentors. Uh, and Marie, I think you're, you know, you're echoing of the importance of the civil society um, parliamentary partnership uh, and your agreement that you know, the, the, this, this problem has uh, increased exponentially and just must be dealt with uh, if we are going to be able to continue to see great women acting uh, as peace builders in the parliamentary forum uh, and across society uh, was a very powerful uh, one for us. Uh, uh, dear panelists, uh, dear participants, uh, my colleague Agata, uh, co-organizers from the ASEAN uh, parliamentary uh, human rights organization. Thank you so much for, uh, for this. It, it really is very, very powerful from our point of view to have uh, he heard these interventions uh, and, and to have learned from them. Uh, and uh, we will um, be delighted to uh, hear from anybody offline who's, who's been involved in the event uh, and uh, who wants to offer any further observations. And we were particularly delighted to continue to work with our three uh, MP champions and Maria going forward. Thank you again. Uh, good night from Bangkok and, and I wish you all uh, peace uh, and uh, a very good day or evening wherever you might be. Thank you again. Thank you.